Mondays go to 11. Once again, I'm Nathan Bell. Joining me, as always, Zach Bartle. Zach, what's going on, man? Oh, nothing, dude. I'm I'm having like, what do you call it when you're really depressed because it's March and it's technically the first day of spring, but it's rotten outside? Oh, yeah, living in Michigan. I'm having a case of living in Michigan. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> We get some nasty weather going on here too. Now, is it is it snowing there or is it just raining? Nah, it's cold, cold rain and wind and gray skies, and it's the time of year when all the snow starts melting, but it also starts like turning black and like revealing all the oh, garbage yeah. that was underneath the whole time. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> not not the pretty stuff. Right. It's it's just hideous. But you know what? It's it's good for Lent, right? The melting away of the ugly. The coming of, of new life is spring. <laughs> yeah, something like that. That sounds good. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I got to spiritualize everything. I'm a man. Yeah, of the absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, dude. Yeah, you know, uh, we were uh, talking, and you know, all, all the time the intro. You know, I do uh, as always. Zach Bartles. Um, you know. I, I love you, Zach, man, but we've been trying to get Greg on for so long because I want to say, you know, as always, Zach Bartles with special gre- guest Greg Dutcher. Who? I know, right? <laughs> that that bum that keeps uh, pushing us off and pushing us back. You know, I was texting with him this uh, earlier this afternoon. It was like four o'clock and he texts me back after like an hour like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was in an elders meeting. I'm like, how the crap do all your elders have time available at four in the afternoon? <laughs> Does he tell them, like, if you're on the board, this takes preeminence over, like, your job and everything? Or, or they're just you that must loyal? give up all. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of uh, – so we have – because of the size of our church, we have several of the elders who are um, pastoral staff. Ah. And then we – so really we only have a couple of lay elders at this point. Um, we're, we're looking to increase that, um, Your over the next have all couple gone years. Pro. That's right. They've all gone pro. Um, and so the, uh, the ones that we do have are actually, um, in education. So they're pretty much done by three o'clock around here. So, um, they can, they can typically get over to the church by four at that point. Huh? Wow. That's, that's unusual for a teacher, isn't it? Get out the door at three when school gets out. I, I, yeah, I know teachers and they're all like working like 60 hour weeks. So it's not it's not specifically teachers. Um, so like there are a couple guidance counselors. Oh, OK, um, That's so a yeah, job there. yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but, you know, we we have nailed down another tentative date for Mr. Dutcher. We will see if. Uh, he ghosts on us again, or if he actually uh, shows up. So we will uh, we will keep you posted, listeners, on that one. Um, but enough about Greg. Let's talk about. Yeah, let's you talk about Greg and- some more. <laughs> what I really like about him. <laughs> oh man, I want to I want to actually talk about uh, you and your current podcasting partner, uh, one Mister uh, Ted Cluck. And oh, I his thought you were going to say Nathan Bell, and you were going to be like, you know what's going on with me? <laughs> but you want to talk about the essay book? I do, I do. I, I want to. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Oh well, let me tell you. This is what it's going to be: eighty uh, essays, Ooh, and nice. they're on. They're broken up into categories. Uh, one of them is pop culture. He's got an awful lot of of essays about different pop culture phenomena. Uh, okay. One about sports, which is. Um, Really, honestly, the only guy who can write about sports in a way that makes me care is Ted. Uh huh. Because generally, I am uh, not into professional sports, but he he gets into always into the, like the the human element of it. And right, right. I love sports movies, and and he kind of captures the narrative kind of thing. And then there's a section that's basically just life, right? Just life in general. And okay. then a fourth section that's like happy rant, gut check pod, inside joke type stuff, um, nice. which is like his. His uh, cigar aficionado piece that he wrote um, for uh, where he interviews uh, Duke uh, yes. Morrison, who's a fictional yeah. coach from a Rapture novel and, yep. and you know stuff like that, where, where he gives the uh, he gives the background to Asian Dawn, which is the terrorist organization that Hans Gruber claims to be uh, trying to <laughs> yes. promote. Yes. 
And, and in his uh, 1980s uh, background piece, uh, Rachel Held Evans is like key to like the founding of Asian Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. That is amazing. That is amazing. I uh, I am definitely going to have to jump on the Kickstarter there and and uh, get myself a copy of that. Now let me ask you: with the essays that are coming out, is it just kind of like that? happy rant gut check back section that has some of the satirical stuff or in some of the other writings are there satirical things in there as well well i mean he writes with his voice which is you know usually uh tongue-in-cheek to some degree but yeah. but not to the point where like nothing is serious i mean he right he, that's what i love about ted's writing whether you, whether it's you know his book on adoption which is uh one of the things you can get if you uh crowdfund uh this this puppy um, as a reward, uh, but or or if he's writing about Mike Tyson, or if he's writing about the church or whatever, there's there's a kind of Gen X, uh, you know, snark to it that I I really connect with, uh, which is why I you know started stalking him until he became one of my best friends. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it the whole thing I think is going to be really entertaining for people, but but also. You know, there's a lot in there about, you know, growing older and, and becoming a dad and like struggles of life and stuff. It's 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 a great it's a great collection. And I'm doing illustrations. Uh, I've mm-hmm. got, I think, 35 illustrations planned or 30 or something. Um, and this is like I'm not a professional artist. And, yep. and when the, when the Kickstarter blew up, I, I, I texted him like because I mean, we, we set the thing at 450 bucks. Right. Right. Gut check has sometimes gone with like really cheap fonts and, you know, royalty free images that are really, you know, easy to procure. We decided with this one, it, 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 this is kind of Ted's uh, definitive collection here uh, yep. after writing 26 or something books. Uh, and so we were going to do it right. So we set it at 450 bucks just so that we could, I mean, the font that we want for the cover is is pretty hefty licensing fee and stuff. I mean, so there's there's expenses for this stuff. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've so far as of this morning, we're at like nine hundred and seventy five dollars. So people are really uh, jumping on board. It's not even half done the Kickstarter campaign. So I texted him. I said, Ted, I feel like this is stupid. We had this whole plan in, in place. Now we should have set the Kickstarter at like five grand and then seen if we could hire Megan Tennant to do the illustrations. Um, oh, you know, if, yeah. With a you know like an advance to her and then a, a piece of the the royalties for each book and he was he was like oh yeah that would be cool <laughs> like, well, that's, next you know, time yeah exactly it would have been amazing but yeah some some other time we'll we'll see if we can make something like that fly but uh, maybe nice. maybe the second printing of the book could have really good illustrations. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, let me ask you another question because um, I'm actually – I'm uh, fairly far behind on my gut check podcast oh, listening. Oh, shame. I, I know. Shame. I know. I've got another podcast that I'm trying to binge and get caught up on and once I get caught up on that, it will be easy for me to get caught up on some of the other ones I've let go. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do right now. But um, but let me ask you, because um, I know you and Ted were working on a couple projects together over at Gut Check. Um, how are those coming along? And I told you I am far behind, so forgive me on that. <laughs> um, but you had uh, another uh, smoking guide coming out, correct? Well, the the volume two of the smoking guide uh, was always on the table, and then along with that, we were talking about doing the Gut Check Guide to Everything. Yep. which was going to just be a bunch of a bunch of like disparate, you know, kind of funny articles and stuff. Uh, basically, that became the essay book. Okay. I was like, you know what? Why don't we just take all of your really good content here and put it out? Um, and then someday down the road, we're going to do the volume two. I, I want to I want to get a good interview in there with Joey Thorne. I want nice. to do uh, uh, a nice uh, kind of bio piece on uh, Mean Gene Scott. Yeah, uh, the cigar yep. smoking preacher, but uh, that's down the road. More more short term, we're looking at uh, putting out the omnibus, the full saga of Reraptured and Reraptured again. Oh, uh, nice! And I'm thinking we're doing that uh, hardcover with a you know nice dust jacket and stuff. Oh, nice! Boss title on the spine, you know. They really uh, treat it like the seminal kind of uh, the, the great American uh, or really the great one world government model uh, <laughs> novel here. This is. 
beyond, I mean, granted, all of the prophecies are about America, but but <laughs> it's even has a wider scope than that. Dude, I'll tell you what you do. That's what you do for the Kickstarter. You get uh, re-raptured in the sequel there on Kickstarter, set that puppy at five grand and get Megan Tennant to do the illustrations for that one. <laughs> Her style doesn't really match, but that would make it even funnier, I think. <laughs> I they're, agree. They're very whimsical. You know, you know, Megan Tennant's art, right? It's all very oh, whimsical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You look at that. It's, it, it always reminds me. Not. It's not the same exact style. Like I don't think she's copied anything, but like the the way it makes me feel is very similar to Bill Watterson when he would do yes. these big splash pages and yes. and like when you look at her stuff, you're like, man, I wish life was more like that. Yes. And it would be so funny to have like a guy <laughs> like like a, a girl's head exploding. Or <laughs> gosh, that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> See that picture of uh, Van Trimpey and uh, and uh, Strongbow sailing up the uh, the light stream there, <laughs> dude. In in the Nakatomi smoke room at the back of my house is a, a framed signed copy of the pic she did of me and Ted in the back of the limo. Oh, uh, nice! Made. Uh, it's one of my prized possessions. That is amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> nice. Oh man. All right. Well, glad to hear things are in full swing over there at Gut Check. Uh, don't forget, folks, check out the Kickstarter for uh, Ted Cluck's essays and definitely join on that. Um, uh, subject we are looking to talk about today is an interesting one. Uh, we get several listener uh, listener mail, you know, questions that come come through our. Uh, mailing station or come through us on Facebook or uh, the interwebs. Um, you know, we get we get listener questions all throughout. And so we had one that was uh, posed fairly recently from our good buddy Jared and wanted to, uh, you know, talk about that one a little bit with you um, at, uh, at length here, Zach. Uh, although tonight we are not going to be quite as lengthy as we normally are. But... Uh, his question was more along the lines of he's got a really good buddy who, uh, you know, really good guy and uh, is not a Christian. And so, you know, he's he's often had, you know, these thoughts like if, you know, if this person dies, like, you know, I don't I don't know if they're in heaven or not. You know, is it is it somehow, you know taking away from God's sovereignty, from God's power? Does it, does it take away or diminish the understanding of how uh, God works in his judgment and in his grace to, to hope that um, people like this, whether it be friends or family, um, are in heaven? Um, you know, Is his friend dead now? Uh, I honestly, I'm not... Sure. Um, are you able to pull up our Facebook page? I think I have that technology in my studio. Okay. I do not currently. I will again have that technology <laughs> soon, but I do not currently have that in mind. So um, I'm going to let you pull that up and I will keep uh, rambling for a little bit um, <laughs> because he sent that as a message um, to us on Facebook. Actually, I'm hoping it was to us and not me directly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will let you pull that up. Yeah, and I opened Chrome and it's just a white box. So I'll tell you what, uh, why don't we start <laughs> discussing it? And if that white box turns into Facebook, <laughs> then we'll find uh, out. <laughs> then I can add, like, I'll sprinkle in additional details as we go and it'll, it'll shape the conversation. All right. That sounds but good. But let me make sure my understanding is the same as your understanding. Basically, actually, wait a minute. Is, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, oh, ooh, 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 I am able oh. to pull it up. I am able to pull there it up. There we go. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Um, okay, here we go. I will read it word for word. Okay. okay. Um, hey, Nathan, was wondering if you guys are ever drawing another creative blank for Epps. We're always blank, so you never have to worry about that. I actually have a suggestion slash question. Is it ever okay to hope for a loved one to be in heaven? Uh, had a friend did pass away, pass away from uh, a heroin overdose a couple years ago. Oh my, I'm sorry. Um, I'm coming up on the anniversary here soon, and this question always haunts me a bit. He was uh, a great guy, really wanted to get involved in a church and whatnot. 
thought highly of me, but never said anything about receiving Christ or anything like that. Needless to say, I'm very scared and unsure of where he may be. It's easier when it comes to Hitler or some truly evil person when it comes to hell or eternal punishment, but it's very unsettling when it may be someone you loved. Um, anyway, you know, and he goes on to just be like, hey, you know, I just – clarification, I'm not, you know, a universalist or Rob Bell sounding. Um, but, you know, uh, is that um, – are those thoughts, are those hopes – that this person um, received Christ, uh, you know, it, does that kind of fall in the realm of that universalist mentality? No, the question then, it, he, he's hoping that his friend had a deathbed conversion? Yeah, I think I think that's where he's going with it is, or even, you know, while he was alive, he had a conversion, but maybe never, um, uh-huh. you know, never, never got into it with him. Um, you know, just kind of that hope that at some point before he passed away, there was a conversion. Well, of course, that's what we should hope. I mean, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't understand where, what could be the, the kind of um, hesitancy or the, the confusion about that. Like if somebody said, you know, I, I reject Jesus, I I think this is all nonsense. And if there, if there were a God who demanded that we believe a certain thing in order to go uh, to heaven, I, I would not want to go to heaven. I'd rather be in hell. Like, you know, you hear that kind of thing. Right. When that person dies, I think you can say, you know, pretty definitively, I, I hate when I hear this kind of like, well, we don't know what's in people's hearts. Uh, yeah, you do. Jesus told us out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right. So that's, you know, one way you know what's in someone's heart. Right. They confess but but if you're not sure about someone's you know where they stood uh yeah the only hope we have is that they put their faith in Jesus and and uh are with him and and uh even with you know Hitler and stuff it, it's it is easier to go well yeah that person deserves eternal punishment because Hitler but even then I don't deserve salvation more than him right and right. so we our hope ought to be that he, uh, you know, somehow, I mean, it doesn't look good, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, yeah. and I had a, uh, a prof, uh, that I, I think about often, uh, in seminary who said, when it comes to funerals and death, yes, I, I know where ever... you're going with this. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, I think so. You want me to say it first? You want me to say it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, don't ever, uh, condemn someone into hell and don't preach them into heaven. Oh, no, not exactly that. Oh, okay. That's, that'll preach. He used to say, don't ever give false hope to people who are gathered uh, or people you're counseling, but don't ever take away hope that they have. Mm. Um, so, you know, when people start talking about somebody that you're pretty sure this person, you, you, you knew them well enough to know what they believed, yeah. and it was not that they believed the gospel, don't stand up and say that. I've heard people do that, you know, like, it's too late for Billy Bob here lying in right, the box, but right. it's not too late for you. That's like James King preaching, right? That's not that's not where we yeah, want to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, if it's, I mean, when you're dealing with somebody who knows the scriptures and knows what they're talking about, I mean, yeah, your only hope is that they put their faith in Jesus. It's not. There's no other hope. Uh, and I had a, another really good uh, prof slash mentor. Uh, who's a, a a good friend of mine named Mike Whitmer, and he when when dealing with the Rob Bell thing as it came, uh, he wrote a response a book that was responding to Rob Bell, okay. and uh, he said when it comes even to like universalism like the idea that when someone dies there's another chance for them to believe in Jesus. Yep. My understanding, my reading of scripture is that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment means basically. You know, uh, even like this morning, I was recording on my, another podcast. Mimi reads the Bible, and we were reading the virgins, the ten virgins. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, the door is shut when, when at, at right. the end. Right. But it wouldn't be entirely unlike what we know of Christ, who is you know this the giver of all grace and mercy. If that wound up being the case, I mean, what a huge, awesome twist that would be at the end. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be like you're. Wait a minute, Jesus, bait and switch. This right. isn't fair. I would just everybody would just go. Oh my gosh, I did not see that coming. Right. And high five all around. Right. And and so what Whitmer said was, 
when it comes to you know a notion of of that that brand of universalism, mm-hmm. not there are multiple ways to Christ, but there's one, or rather one, multiple ways to God, but there's one way to God, and maybe everyone has you know another opportunity uh, after their death or something or at death or whatever right. that we don't know about. He said we all ought to wish for that, yeah. but we don't really have the grounds to hope for it yeah. because hope has got to be rooted in something. Right. Yeah. So that's a lot for me. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I, a couple things were, were coming to mind um, when you were talking. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, um, I, you know, in, in my family, we've experienced uh, several uh, deaths, uh, you know, several tragedies over the years. Um, and some of them we, we, you know, were as sure as anyone can be that they were believers. Um, and it was, you know, there was uh, great rejoicing in that. There were others that there were question marks. Um, you know, it was uh, some long, longer drawn out uh, deathbed type scenarios uh, the person knew uh, that they were going to die, uh, and there was opportunities to speak with them about the gospel, to to talk with them about what the Bible has to say about salvation, um, and they passed away. And the question was always, "Well, did they make a decision?" Um, and the answer was, "I don't know." Um, so do we sit there and dwell on the unknown or do we do we hope and pray for what you talked about our great hope in Christ um you know and and so you know i i am not i believe because god stands outside of time you know like and this might sound a little odd and weird but i am not even above when i think about that retroactively and i know it's too late like i know they can't make a decision but like i am not above thinking back on those moments and being like you know god i really pray that you worked in that person's life um to to work you know your your great gift of salvation um and again that's not something where i think you know uh what you were talking about where oh maybe they have one more opportunity but it's just you know, God isn't bound by time. And so I don't necessarily think those prayers are, um, void, um, because here in the human timeline experience that has ended. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So you're thinking about, uh, God being outside of time. I, I've often like prayed for something thinking it was future and then find out that it was past. Yeah. And that my prayers were answered. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and you go, well, I, I mean, for all I know, God knew I would pray for it and, and right. took that into account. Right. Uh, yeah. Although, you know, prayers for the dead, uh, it would be firmly in the Roman Catholic right. and outside of the uh, historic Protestant view of, of things. But, right. Well, and that's yeah. the thing. It's not like I'm necessarily. It's not like I'm praying for them currently. I'm praying, you know, in in the past tense, you know, that in those moments when they were hearing the gospel that, you know, um, that that they did make that decision, that he did work in those in those moments um, for salvation. You know, so it's not again like I don't want to make it sound like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently actively praying for them. Now it's, you know, it's thinking on those and in, in, in those thoughts, thinking about them, I guess, in the process of prayer. I'm talking to God about those moments um, is more of what it is. Um, but the, the other thing that kind of came to mind when you were talking about that is uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. Um, have you ever read that book? Uh-huh. And like he, you know, he puts out this idea of this group of people, you know, going to, uh, I mean, almost like a purgatory type place. Um, but the fact that there are those who go there who have the opportunity, you know, the, this one last decision to make. And again, I don't, I don't think, uh, Lewis's theology is all there, especially because he did, um, b- believe in a purgatorial type state, but, um, it's it's a fascinating read um, because what it kind of shows and demonstrates is, you know, it doesn't matter if these these people are standing in glory. Many of them would even still actively reject. 
Um, and so it's, it's just a fascinating read in that regard. And that's kind of what was coming to mind when you were talking about that. Uh, and, uh, Lewis did a great job in, in one of the last Narnia books too, with the, uh, when they finally get to the, oh, what does he call heaven in, in Narnia? It's, uh, the, you know, the new country, whatever. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. The new country. And, yeah. and all those, uh, like little guys are like in a circle. Yep tight in a circle and they and they they are complaining like oh it's so cramped here and oh it's so horrible here and they're like no look around man it's beautiful it's lush is all the food you could want they're like oh it's disgusting i hate yeah. it and like because yeah the, the, it was so so yeah i mean the, there's there's certainly i i don't i don't struggle nearly as much as i used to uh the more i come to understand how complete zero merit any of us have mm -hmm. for our own salvation yeah. the less i am uh kind of scandalized by the notion that uh there is uh a, a eternal punishment right but again yeah when you know someone it, it would be i would be worried about the kind of person who who was like well i'm so spiritual i don't even I don't even hope that they got saved. You right, know, I, right. I know God's glorified in the the punishment of the unregenerate. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, God's glorified in in all justice that he does. Right. But clearly, I mean, God also, we're told, does not desire the death of the wicked, but that they repent and live. Right. And so we're just wanting the same thing. When we when we think about those who have gone before us and think, my goodness, I hope. And I mean, think about like, the guys that were friends with the thief on Jesus left, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they, they're, go, they're going, dude, if, if, uh, yeah, you know, Chris thief on the left, that was his name. Uh, if, if there's a hell, he's there right. because we know all the stuff we did. We know right up to the end, he was defiant. He was even cursing out the Roman centurions and soldiers as they brought him to Golgotha. He, oh man, that guy was just, and we know what they didn't, right. that, that he came to faith. Oh, no, the one on his right the one, was the yeah. one that uh, I don't think it tells us, right. but uh, <laughs> historically, uh, traditionally. Yep. So, like, it, it's it's outside of our hands, and you don't know what ultimately someone's you know, kind of status in God's eyes was. And, you know, part of, I think, maybe maybe we can have a little friendly debate here on terminology. I think part of the confusion comes from you know, thinking of a decision. Yes. If, yes. if it's something the person is doing, and I know that that's just language you're using because you've heard it your whole life. Right. But, but if it's, this is a decision you made, I need to see some proof of that decision. But if it's something that God is doing, regenerating someone and giving them, granting them repentance and giving them faith as a gift. Right. Then it's not it, it it doesn't need to be proved to anybody, right? Because the only person who's who's standing in judgment is the same God who gave it, right? Yeah. So I don't know how common deathbed conversions are. I know that one happened uh, on Golgotha, and I know I've been present for some that I think are legit. Where I'm thinking, if this guy somehow miraculously rallies and gets better, I fully expect him to uh, live a different life than he did. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it's interesting too because, um, you know, in in scripture, you know, there there's scripture that you read where you know people ask, "What must I do to be saved?" And in some, the response is, "Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth." In some, it's just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you know, there's there's and in some, it's believe and be baptized. Right. So, you know, the common thread in all of them is believe. You know, mm -hmm. and so we know that baptism doesn't lead to salvation because, uh, you know, Paul uh, gives a whole dissertation about that. Um, you know, that there is one way to Christ, and that is through by believing in who he is um, and, and what he's done. Um, you know, I mean, because it says even the, you know, the demons believe and, and shudder and, um, but, you know, we know that, that the common thread in, in what the disciples are telling is, is believe. Um, and right. so, and what James is doing there, of course, is, is right. really comparing he's, it's a play on words, right. Right. you know, belief the, the pisteo as a theological concept pregnant with New Testament meaning right. or believe, uh, in terms of intellectual assent. Right. If you've only got the, the intellectual assent, 
you're even less than the demons because they actually have a, a response. They shudder. Yes. Uh, if you believe and do nothing, uh, your intellectual assent isn't actually biblical faith. Right. Uh, and when somebody on their deathbed, the reason that the deathbed is such a, a perfect place and it has been in every tradition and throughout all of church history for salvation is because that is when people who, who know they very well may die or likely will die. Mm-hmm. Or some people are told you're, you've, you're dying, man. Right, you're right. You're, your kidneys are done and you will be dead within a day or something. They're thinking about eternity and... God has always used these sorts of opportunities uh, where people are led to the point of seeing themselves for who they are. Yes. Yeah. He uses those to open their eyes to who he is yes. and, and the need they have for him. And so I, I mean, that, that's why there's always been last rites. There's always been anointing of the sick. There's, um, there's a wonderful, I have a little Lutheran, I have a million of those pastor's manuals, uh, minister's companion, little books. Yep. And and I uh, really enjoy the um, – it's called the Brief Rite for Anointing the Sick. And it's it's basically for uh, those who are are going to die soon. Okay. Um, yeah. That's the way it's, it's framed anyway. And it leads people through uh, affirming and, and uh, confessing the Apostles' Creed, uh, confessing their sins and receiving absolution, which I think is something that should happen in every church, mm-hmm. uh, especially evangelical churches. Right. And – it's a wonderful opportunity because, you know, like Ash Wednesday, what, historically what you have said when the minister applies the ash cross on your forehead is, remember you are dust and to dust you will return. Remembering your mortality reminds you how high the stakes are and kind of sweeps away all the crap we think of as important, which isn't in light of the fact that we are going to return to dust. One thing is is all important. Yeah. And so, yeah, there there may have been, if, if, even if, like, say, Jared's buddy had heard the gospel, I hope Jared proclaimed it to him, but if he didn't, I hope he's not living in a, you know, shame and right, guilt right. And continually. I hope it just kind of makes him want to do it now. But if if someone had proclaimed the gospel to him and he had kind of waffled, it's very likely that, that uh, near the end, I don't know if a heroin overdose, you probably don't know you're going to die, mm-hmm. but maybe he felt like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm slipping into this thing and I'm scared. Right. That could have been the impetus to make him, you know, think, you know, throw himself. What is what is putting your faith in Jesus, but throwing yourself at his mercy? Right. Yeah. And, and that could have happened. Why not? Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me let me kind of shift gears a little bit here. Um, and because we don't have a ton of time left, but want to get your thoughts on moving into a different direction. What about the idea of being uncomfortable with eternal judgment. Um, again, not that you necessarily don't believe it, but you know, that it just, you know, you think about that and it's like, Oh, you know, there, there's just, there's a sickening feeling that comes over when, Mm -hmm. you know, you think about, Oh man, you know, friends and loved ones. And I, you know, I, this is hard, but you know, I, I just, I, I dislike that I dislike that idea. I dislike that thought. Mm-hmm. Um, what What are your thoughts on that? I would I would be really really creeped out by anyone who who wasn't weirded out by yeah. and, and didn't really dislike that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, here's how I I've always thought of this. Um, Whitmer, but Dr. Whitmer was a similar uh, influence in, in how I think about these things. Uh, Meta narrative theology, right? Mm-hmm. Basically, a a three act story with like the the fourth act that's the very the very end, mm-hmm. um, you know the after credit scene perhaps. You've got excuse me. You've got uh, creation. Mm-hmm. God makes everything. It's good. Yep. It's very good. In fact, it's Tov Ma'ov. Fall. We take what was very good and perfect and fracture it, and God curses it, and it's and death enters, and sickness, and sorrow, and everything. Then you have redemption, in which God goes about beginning the re- reversing of the curse and uh, redeeming those who jumped headlong into sin, and then consummation, at which point uh, Christ returns and uh, you have glorification 
and uh, we we don't believe in anything like purgatory. Right. We don't believe right. that glorification is a process, just like we don't believe justification is a process. It's a work, of, or it's not a work of God. It's an act of right. God. So burned away anything that would keep you from standing in the presence of God, and and there you are. Uh, all of that story makes perfect sense except for like everything that, that God was like, I'm introducing creation. Of course he's going to create and it's going to be good and perfect. He's God and he's, and he's good and perfect redemption. Of course he's going to come and save us uh, and, and seek and save the lost because that's what his heart is. Consummation. Of course he wins in the end. And of course he'll come back for his own because he's faithful. He's a God of loving kindness. And, and uh, you know, there's that wonderful Hebrew word uh, often trans- translated uh, mercy in the, in the King James, uh, but it's hesed, and it really should be uh, covenant loyalty. Mm. So all of these things make perfect sense, except for our contribution. Right. Sin doesn't make sense. Yeah. So sickness and death and suffering and all those things, anything filed under that or, or immediately tied to that isn't going to sit well with mm-hmm. us. And that's why when you stand next to the, the ICU bed of you know, somebody you know, who's 35 years old and they've been given virtually no chance to live and they've got two little kids, our response, it's okay to uh, oh, someone else is calling. I wonder if it's Donald J. Trump again. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's uh, the Reverend King. <laughs> um, our, our response: It's okay for us to kind of be angry with God. He, he's okay with that. Mm-hmm. He he could take David's anger. He can take ours. He's, it, it doesn't make sense to lie to him. Right. But our, as we become more and more sanctified, our response should be that we hate sin more. Yeah. Yeah. We should we should look at that and say I I just hate sin. It should make us hate our own sin more. And, and so it doesn't make sense. All of these things uh, that, that grow out of sin, uh, they shouldn't make sense and sit well with us. They're, they, and, and God being a perfectly holy God, when eventually every, the, every opportunity that someone may have had for salvation ha- has been exhausted and, and they stand before him, uh, it's not because God is mean, but because of that that fall and and our sin and that part of the story that that just is it's like a sick, distorted, you know, carnival funhouse mirror picture. Yeah. And that really it should be off putting. Yeah. It's 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 horrifying, and yet it's our contribution, not not his. Uh, it, it, and and I'm not trying to take let God off the hook. Um, it, it is God's character to be perfectly holy. He can't have sin in his presence. Right. And, you know, I, it, it's possible. It, again, it, it is not, I can't tell God what to do. I can tell you that he will do what he said he will do. Right. And so if we understand what we have in Scripture correctly, we have a lifetime to follow him. And after that, we will be, uh, either welcomed into his presence, well done, done good and faithful servant, mm-hmm. or will be told, depart from me, I never knew you. Yeah. But but remember again, the uh, parable of the, the workman. Uh, here's another one, me, me and Mimi were working on uh, that, that just popped up this week. And I, why am I promoting my other podcast? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we like to do that but I was just <laughs> I was just thinking about it because we were, we were discussing it. That that you know the the laborers that were hired in the eleventh hour. That's where that saying the eleventh hour yeah. comes from, which is like right before quitting time. They got the same reward as those who started at the beginning of the day. Yeah, yeah. Because the reward is in the 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 merit the the what we get. It's all based on who he is. Right. And so if someone does come to faith at the very end, they they still are welcomed into his presence. And that, I mean, that's where our focus should be. Right. And, and, you know, the thoughts of uh, the reality of, of hell and man, Brian McLaren's pathetic, like, like horse yeah. trying to stand up for the first time <laughs> attempts to like say that Jesus didn't believe in hell or he was just like throwing the Pharisees teaching back in their face or something. No, Jesus talks more about hell than about almost anything yeah. else yep. in the gospels. Yep. So we we can't deny that it's real unless we are just basically saying, God, you need to catch up with the times. Right. And yet I, I, there's no reason for us to want to exult 
in anyone's punishment. That was the same punishment that was due us. And in fact, that punishment was met out. It was just met out on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. He paid for it. So hell's a reality for all of us. Yeah. And... And so it's it's nothing to be flippant about, and it, it's nothing to be like, all right, good, Bin Laden's in hell. I, I've been on record with, all oh, good, Bin Laden got shot and killed. But uh, even then, I mean, I I don't stand before God on my own two feet in any better position than than he. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think I think that's the thing. It's the difference between. Um, what makes us feel uncomfortable? Uh, what makes us feel anxious uh, about things that are in God's word that we know that are true and denying the truth and the power that's in God's word, you know, and, and there is a difference there because not everything we read in scripture is going to jive with us. Like you said, we are, we, we are separated from a holy and just God when sin, uh, you know, entered and it was brought in because of us, it, it distorted everything about us, you know? And so that we we are trying to understand and comprehend an infinite God and not just, um, you, you know, not just how he feels about us in the human race, but also, you know, motives and things like that. And, and obviously we're never going to fully understand those motives because he is God, um, but, but 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 we're trying to because we're trying to get to know God. He is a personal God, and He wants us to get to know Him. And so, you know, we we look at Christ and we see what the Father looks like through you know the Son. And but there's still so much that is um, a mystery, and we we can never come from the reference point of holiness and perfection because we were never there. Um, you know, Adam and Eve were there at one point, but but no one since then, except for Christ, has ever has ever been there. And so, you know, trying to be uh, settled, uh, and that's and that's even a poor choice of words. In the same way that that um, God is settled with His justice and how all that works, because it, it's not just it, it's not just His. Uh, his his love and his grace and his mercy that are perfect, but it's also his justice. It's his righteousness, and and we don't have that. And so for us trying to trying to comprehend, like you said, I would be very concerned if you know uh, hearing Christians, and I have been concerned hearing Christians that are like, oh well, he got what he deserved, you know. And, and we talked about this a little bit. Um, uh, I mean, it was probably a little over a year ago now when we talked about this, when um, uh, Stephen Hawking and, and Billy Graham died within, uh, it was within a week of each other, right? And mm-hmm, there yeah. were those, you know, there were those snarky remarks, you know, oh, look where Billy Graham is and look where, you know, Stephen Hawking is. And it's like, wait a minute, what, what are you doing? Like, th- this is where we're making snarky remarks and comments um, about, this person who, um, a- as far as we can tell, um, is is not in heaven, um, and and even that I think is shoddy because um, you know when you read some of the things that he wrote, uh, he he's been up and down about a greater power in the universe. I mean, he said he was an atheist in in some respect, but. You know, it certainly wasn't like it's certainly not like Richard Dawkins who goes out blasting all religion and all, um, you know, faith systems, especially Christianity. Um, at least as far as I have read and could tell, he there wasn't like the 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 vitriolic hatred toward um, toward Christians and toward God, um, and so you know who. I mean, here was a man who, you know, was uh, very much, you know, uh, captivated in his own mind. I mean, he could speak, you know, through assistance and things like that. But you know, we don't know when God is going to pull someone through because that isn't that the point of it is that it's not about him. It's about God. And if God chose to break through in those final hours to this man, um, 
then then isn't he just as redeemed as the person who's been, as you said, the person who's been laboring their entire life, like like Billy Graham? Um, you know, I mean, wouldn't wouldn't that be like the greatest thing to see in heaven? You know, Billy Billy Graham, Stephen Hawking. You know, they die within a week of each other, and you know, of course, as much as we know, Billy Graham is there with Jesus, and then what if Stephen Hawking was there as well? And we just hear, yeah, you know, God just broke through all of that, you know, within those final hours. And, and you know, I, I, I mean, how much – how cool would that be to, to see and experience? But that's different to think those things and, and to ponder those things. But we're not denying that if he didn't do those things, where he would be, you know. And I think that's the big difference is those who deny – Oh, well, you know, I'm sure that there's no final judgment. Well, no, there is. The Bible is very clear on that. Um, and, and we need to treat those things with the gravity that um, I, I think they are treated with in Scripture. Well, I mean, I, I got to take issue with uh, your assessment. I think it's pretty clear that, that Billy Graham also w- w- is in hell because he was a 33rd degree Mason <laughs> and he was in bed with all those Catholics and he sent them the decision cards. And also he, he met with Democrat presidents and didn't try to make them Republican. So, I mean, <laughs> man, can't, 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 uh, no, no good heroes in the world today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> can't rely on anyone. Well, yeah, I mean, you gotta have you gotta have enough chum to feed the uh, discernment bloggers. And... <laughs> oh man, I, I gotta I gotta stop listening to uh, the Pulpit and Pan podcast every uh, morning. You know, <laughs> well, I do my my crunches. See, that's how you know that I don't really listen to it that's because like, I don't do any. Crunches. You don't do any crunches. <laughs> <laughs> that whole story falls apart. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh goodness well i i think uh, i hear my family i think the the casbah is more or less rocked here um although i don't know how definitively we answered the original question i think that my if i had to just answer it in a in a word mm-hmm. i would say yes <laughs> yes it's it's okay and good to hope that anyone that the, anyone who's who's, yeah. who's died is with Jesus. I mean, yeah. that's that is the hope. That's that's our only hope for anyone. So it's yeah, that's that's a good hope to have. That's the only thing you want to cling to is your final your final hope is is that that Jesus uh, is glorified in everything. And and the best way we want people to be glorified in or God to be glorified in people that that are around us is for them to put faith in Him and and be redeemed. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right, man. Well, since you can hear your family coming in, we're going to go ahead and uh, close out here. It's been a uh, good conversation, a little bit uh, shorter than normal, but still good nonetheless. Really enjoyed it. Looking forward to uh, uh, attempting to get Greg back on in a couple weeks here. We got a special guest coming on uh, next week that we are Uh uh, going to be talking about a book that he wrote. And so looking forward to that. I'm just going to leave that hanging there. And, um, Zach, we just rocked the Casbah. These go to 11.